what I call the anthropological dimension of democracy at large. Well, as the chairman of the drafting committee, he knew he would be in a position to promote a political regime, democracy, that for him was much more than a political regime. He saw democracy as endowed with a huge potential social. And that's something he has always kept in mind. He never looked at democracy only as an institutional mechanism. He looked at it as a sociological concept. As early as 1919, we have, we have to go back again to the young and the young. As early as 1919, he said, if you bring together in an assembly people from different social backgrounds, then we make a huge impact. Because, I quote, participation in a group is the only way of being like minded with the group. Each group tends to create its, its own distinctive type of like mindedness. No, we, are, we are in the caste system, no? we are deeply in the caste system. But where there are more groups than one to be brought into particular union, there would be conflict among the differently like-minded. And so long as the groups remain isolated, the conflict is bound to continue and prevent the harmony of action. A political body can only be formed when barriers between groups are abolished and communication made possible. And that's what democracy permits. Debates, deliberation, friction, tensions, but interaction. At least in the assembly, those who represent the Dalits and who are Dalits themselves are part of a new anthropological animal. That was his objective. At the same time, he was particularly clear that to break these social barriers, political democracy will never be sufficient and some economic democracy will be absolutely necessary. And you will hear these two <coughs> phrases in the um, Constituent Assembly debates from Albert Kerr repeatedly. Economic democracy, political democracy, they can't be separated. What is not very clear is what comes first? Can we have political democracy and then economic democracy? Or can economic or, or can political democracy survive without economic democracy? And he is not very clear himself when you read uh, these debates. Of course, the assumption is we'll make a political system, democratic. And it will have repercussion and will generate more equality, more rights, more economic democracy. At the same time, he is very well aware of the fact that legal democracy cannot survive if there is no some economic democracy below. And he has this fascinating vision of why has democracy collapsed in Europe in late 30s, early 40s. For that reason. He says, <coughs> Parliamentary democracy took no notice of economic inequalities and did not care to examine the result of freedom of contract on the parties to the contract. Political democracy cannot succeed when there is no social and economic democracy. Why parliamentary democracy collapsed so easily in Italy, Germany, and Russia? Why did it not collapse so easily in England and the USA? To my mind, there is only one answer, namely, there was a greater degree of economic and strong democracy in the little countries than it existed in the former. By the way, Bennington Moore, in a fascinating book of the 60s, The Social Origins of Democracy and Authoritarianism, we we'll take the same countries and we we'll make the same conclusion. 
massive book that I'm better and visualize. So that's that's why there is this constant worry of are we doing enough on the economic side for political democracy to survive? And how can we make sure that without imposing socialism on India, because it doesn't want it doesn't want the word socialism to be there. But without doing it, can we at least make sure that we will go in that direction in order to give the, the, the foundations that democracy needs politically? Another thing, another issue that I want to mention bypassing, but it's so relevant for today's India that I want to mention that. It says, societies remain democratic not only if they have some economic democracy, but also if they resist hero worship. Hero worship. You, you know what? Hero. Hero worship. H-E-R-O. I'm sure you understand. <laughs> you can guess. It's very interesting. You know what to be selfie? <laughs> so this is 50 years before the selfies. He knows that this is a great danger for the democracy. Let me cite him again because it is so refreshing. There is nothing wrong in being grateful to great men who have rendered lifelong services to the country. But there are limits to gratefulness. As has been said well, as has been well said by the Irish patriot Daniel O'Connell, no man can be grateful at the cost of his honor, no one can be grateful at the cost of her chastity, and no nation can be grateful at the cost of its liberty. This question is far, for, far more necessary in the case of India huh? than in the case of any other country. For in India, Bhakti, and these days we have Bhakti, <laughs> or what may be called the path of devotion or hero worship, plays a part in its politics unequal in magnitude by the part it plays in the politics of any other country in the world. Bhakti in religion may be the road to the salvation of the soul, but in politics, bhakti or hero worship is a sure road to degradation and to eventual dictatorship. That's something he wrote in the 40s. So democracy had one more reason to be really established. So, and I'm going to go to my conclusion now. We have, with Ambedkar as a chairperson of the drafting committee of the constitution, a man who believes in democracy as a legal system, separation of powers, independence of the judiciary, everything, but who also believes in democracy as an anthropological concept, the antidote to social hierarchies and the antidote to hero worship. And he's prepared to make a lot of concessions to the Congress and even to Patel to make that happen. But till the end, at least till the late 40s, probably, yeah, till the late 40s, he will try to believe that. The elite groups will recognize the legitimate demands of the Dalits and others, expecting from them the kind of goodwill he had himself extended to others. And this is exactly why he has been disappointed. Because this goodwill never came. And the turning point was, of course, the um, Indo Court Bill 
when you realize that yes, we have this democratic setup, but this sociological substance you wanted to infuse in it would never come, at least, would not come as quickly as it would. So you all know this famous speech by him in 55, five years after, four years after he resigned from the uh, government of India. With this constitution, we built a temple for a god to come in and reside, but before the god could be installed, the devil has taken possession of it. What else can we do except destroy the temple? He would not destroy the temple, he would not enter the revolutionary movement, he will do something different that you all know. He will convert to Buddhism and find the real democracy. Because in the end it is the same quest, it is exactly the same quest. When you read his interview, the transcript of his interview, uh, on All India Radio. It's very good. Positively, my social philosophy may be said to be enshrined in three words. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. Let no one, however, say that I, am, that I have borrowed my philosophy from the French Revolution. I have not. My philosophy has roots in religion and not in people's science. I have derived them from the teaching of my master, the Buddha. In his philosophy, liberty and equality had a place. He gave the highest place to fraternity as the only real safeguard against the denial of liberty and equality or fraternity, which was another name for brotherhood or humanity, which was again another name for religion. So the conversion of 56 that has been interpreted as a kind of escape lane, as a kind of admission of failure, can be certainly seen in a different light. He was fighting for representation of the Dalits in the power structure, a democratic setup that could transform society deeply. That could not happen as quickly as he wanted, but he found the same objective. He achieved the same objective by converting to Buddhism. And uh, in that sense, he could not die a bitter man. 